And what a nice jury. Welcome to the show. And welcome to the show as well. This week, the show is so exciting, it's so good, I don't want anybody to miss it, because we're going to take a little bit of a trip into the past. Very exciting trip in the past, when they used to do tricks like this. Can I show you this one? Um, thank you, McGee. The wonderful McGee. Now, this is, as you can see, it's a glass tray, it's a glass vase, nothing connected at all. And um, what else are we going to use? We've got this wondrous fan, which we've got here, you see. <laughs> and uh, what else have we got? We've got, oh, the lid. I should put that on as well, shouldn't I? Oh, a scarf. Nothing in the scarf, you know? Olé. So what we do is we just put that over there like that. I wish I was smooth and elegant, like what other magicians are. And then you've got this, which is a glass lid for the vase, you see? And you put that on there like that, and you cover it like this, like so, and you take this. What else have we got on here? Oh, look, this is good. Look at this. Okay. Right, what's your name, sir? Holger. Holger. Where are you from? Hong Kong. Hong Kong? Oh, okay. We seem to be having a run on you lads lately, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a tunnel. Hey, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Ah. Now, once you have got this aflame, like this, you blow it out. Okay? This is incense, all right? Don't dash into a religious ceremony. It's, it's just, <laughs> it's incense. Now, what it is, we want you to fan this of smoke across towards the vase. Would you do that for me? Yeah. Stood up. You fan it across yourself, okay? You open the fan and you just... <laughs> you know, now what... Look at that. Now, while we've been doing that, the audience have been keeping their eyes on the fan and on the vase at the same time and on this in my hand. We have a three-eyed audience. So, you sit down there and I'll do it myself. You fan this out like this and we go... Wah, 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 wah. You see? Like that. Then we douse that out there, which makes a wondrous fizzing noise. And then what we do is this. We take this like this from here. Okay? And the vase, as I say, have been in full view throughout. And yet now, it is wondrous. It is full of smoke. <laughs> a funny start to the programme, but in fact, a very serious start to the programme also, because that kind of trick used to be performed by Chinese illusionists. And once upon a time, there were a few, none more famous than one called Chung Ling Su. He's mostly famous because of an accident that took place, a fatal accident. Chung Ling Su was shot and killed on the stage of the Wood Green Empire, March the 23rd, 1918. And by an amazing set of sequence, coincidences, whatever, it came to the knowledge of the people that run this program that the man who was on stage with Sue the night he was shot was still alive. And he's with us, and he's in the studio tonight. Would you please welcome Jack Grossman. <laughs> nice to meet you, Jack. Welcome to the show. What exactly happened on, on the night he was killed? It was pandemonium because Quite a lot of people went out of the theatre really didn't know what had happened. They didn't realise he'd been shot and killed. No. They thought it was the end of the performance and quite a queer way of ending it. Yeah. And he was attempting to catch a bullet on a plate, That's right. wasn't he? Well, you see, we were removed from the stage after half an hour with my uh, close assistant who was also firing a gun at him and taken to the police station and kept there all night. Oh. And we were only released in the early morning when we were told that Chan Su had died and they didn't need it anymore. Um, that was all that, uh, and then it. what, there was an inquest? And well, there was, uh, months afterward, the guns had been examined by a gunsmith, and they brought in, uh, the, the, after getting the report from the gunsmith, they brought in a death, his death was brought on by misadventure. Mm. I know that, because I've, I've obviously read it all my life about Chung Ling Su, uh, there were various other theories put forward of murder and suicide, and I know they found a fault in the gun itself, Yes. You know, uh, but uh, how do you feel about those? Well, 
there's only one possibility, and uh, certainly I wouldn't think there was any possibility of a murder. No. But suicide is a very clear possibility. Mm. He might have decided to end his life in a very dramatic way. Mm. It all happened on a Saturday night, the last performance at One Green Empire, and in his contract he had to wear a bulletproof waistcoat. Mm. But that night at One Green Empire he didn't wear it. And also, during the week, he used to travel with us from Wood Green's uh, station, underground, home, and he really opened up to us and started talking to his, his advance manager was with us and the two Chinese boys, and he was relating how unhappy he was, and that he was far happier as a young man earning five pound a week than he was earning 500 pound a week. Yeah. Which was rather surprising that he should speak that way to us. Yeah. And this was during that week, and on the Saturday night, he was killed. Yeah. Well, I know, in fact, Jack, that you will soon use two men on stage as a sort of a, a little playlet about the Boxer Rebellion, wasn't it? Yes. And that you were one of the two men who had guns on the stage, yes. and you both fired at the same time. Yes. And to this day, do either of you know, do you know who fired the actual bullet? No, we'll never know. Nobody will know. Another thing I'd like to mention is Chang Yi Su looked after those two guns himself. He wouldn't let anybody else handle them. He kept them in his dressing room, he, he prepared them, and only released them on stage to his Japanese stage manager. Well, I, I'd just like to say thank you for coming on the programme. You're going to be on in a little later on. Back, actually, to do what happened in 1918. You see, we're going to recreate the scene and I shall play the part of Sue, and we are going to attempt to catch the bullet on the plate, which in fact Sue had done for 12 years before he was fatally shot. Jack has agreed to take part in the playlet again, and we just hope that it doesn't go wrong like it did on that night. <laughs> Now, we've had some incredible people on this show who have done amazing feats of balance, but we've never had one with more skill than my next guest. He came in here this afternoon, and we all just sat there going, like that, he's fantastic. He is Crazy Monroe.
Once again, in the laboratory conditions, we are going to try out a small example of extrasensory perception. This time, a kind of water divining. And on this little carousel, we have got six glasses of water. 
And the gentleman who's watching very, very closely, your name? Chris. Chris. And where are you from? I'm from Welling in Kent. Welling in Kent. Chris of Welling in Kent. And overhead also, we've got a camera for the people at home who can watch just as closely as you, but from a different angle. First, I'm going to pollute three of these glasses of water by using a pollutant. And it's in a little dropper. And I don't want you to drink the stuff. I'm just going to try to locate it later in an unusual way. Would you point to one glass and I will pollute the water in that glass? Okay. That one? You sure? Uh -huh. Okay. We'll just mix that up. Now that is polluted water. Yes? Would you like to point to another glass? Another one. Okay. We'll do the same thing there. That's two glasses. Third and final glass. Okay. That one. That one. Now, there you had a free choice. The glasses were spun around to start with, and three of them are now polluted. Now, here we've got some little paper bags. Now, the paper bags are clear. Okay, you can see right inside there. And we're just going to move them out so you can see inside them. And what I'm going to do is put in there one of these glasses like so, all right? Mm -hmm. And we're just going to just fold it over like that. Now. That goes on there, and I want you to help me by doing exactly the same thing. Just put a glass in there, and I'll do a glass in there. We'll just speed things up a little bit, all right? I'll put a glass in like this. Now, the fact that some of the, the bags have got little green marks on because of my handling that pollutant doesn't really matter at all, as you'll appreciate a little later on, okay? No, another glass there, just, just put it in the bag. And I'll just put this in like this. They're a little bit fiddly, but they only have enough space for one glass and one glass only. They are opaque, and the tops are folded over like that. Okay, and put on there. Like that. And this, and this goes in there. Now, we now have six glasses sealed in bags that are opaque that are on a little carousel. Now, what I want you to do, or rather I'll do it to start with, I'm going to give this a few turns around like that. And I want you to look up in the air. Look up in the air. That means that you couldn't possibly keep track of anything down here, all right? right. Now, I'm going to go behind the wall where I can't keep track of anything down here. And I want you to give a few turns, then place these bags in the box one at a time in any order that you like. Then you pick up the lid of the box and you put it on here, all right? That's what I want you to do. Now, once I'm behind the wall, you can do that. The jury members can see that, in fact, I cannot see any monitors, television monitors. I don't know what's going off at all. All I know is that you should be carrying out your instructions. You should be placing them by now into the box one at a time. Tell me when you've done that. Okay, not yet. No? All of them have got to go in, in any order you like, and then just put the lid on the box and tell me when you've got the lid on the box. Yep, the lid's on the box. The lid is on the box, good. Now what happens now is this. Somewhere in there are three glasses that are, in fact, polluted. All right? You agree? Mm -hmm. And also, what we've got here is um, discs on the top. They're there for a reason, so that I can put these on the top. All right? Now, I'm going to try and divine which of these is polluted. I'm going to go for that one on the end. Okay? I don't know why. I just think it is. And I'm going to go... Uh, no. No. Now, there's nothing special about these, by the way. You can have a look at one. They're just, uh, discs. Mm -hmm. I think this one. I'll put a P on that, too. There's only one to find. Um, I'm going to go here, which makes a very even pattern. Oh, were you aware of anything at all, or did you just put them in? No, I just put them in randomly. Well, well, let's see. If we open this up, We'll just see if I'm correct or not. We'll take out that, which is the bag I said was polluted, and this one which I thought was polluted, and, and this one which I thought was polluted. But I may be wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. You just don't know when you, when you try these things. We'll just put the glass there and the glass there. Now, these three are for you, all right? And what I want you to do is remember that I marked these before I opened the box. You had a choice of anything. You were swung round and round. No way could anybody know, right. normally. So, let's open up one of the bags. You open yours, and let's hope you've got a clear glass of water. Just open it up and take it out. I've got a polluted one. Well, I've got a clear one. You've got a clear one. 
and just pour it into the big glass like that okay and get rid of that and the bags of course are just bags all right so we get rid of all of that let's try one more let's try this one Uh, yes, I've got a polluted one, so I'll pour that in there as well. And I want you to do the same. And again, this bags. Yes? Yeah. All right. And that only leaves us with this one. And if we've got this right, we've had 100% success with this most unusual method, if you like, of water divining. Yes, I've got the last polluted one, which means you must have the last of the clear ones. You pour it in there. And just to prove that there was no chemicals added on the way or anything like that, I'll drink this. Mm -hmm. That's just water, and we located that under laboratory conditions. <laughs> My next guest is a gentleman I've admired for a very long time. He happens to be quite a superb magician. But we discovered he has something else, a most unusual collection. Here to talk about it and present it is Billy McComb. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to show you something that you don't often see nowadays, and my God, there's probably a reason for it. This was because a gentleman named Dr. McNulty Hawkins, one day was sitting in his back garden. He was very weird, weird man, because one in three people in England today are weird. In fact, those of you in the audience, look at the person on your left, look at the person on your right, and if they seem all right, worry. <laughs> Anyhow, he was weird, and he dug a hole in his back garden, a monstrous excavation, and suddenly when he finished it, he thought, ha, ah, I wonder if the British Museum, among the many rarities that they exhibit nowadays, have actually got a hole like this. And he called them up and they said, no, we haven't. He said, right, send along a truck. And then we load it onto the back of the truck and we give it to you at the British Museum. And you can exhibit it. What they did was they backed up the truck to load the hole onto the truck. And they backed the truck up too far and they backed it right into the hole. And some passing council workers filled in the hole, so they forgot all about it. And that's why you never, ever see now a hole in the British Museum. And this got the professor to thinking. He thought, ha, ah, holes are very useful. I mean, it wasn't the holes in your skin, you know, matching where your eyes came through. You, you wouldn't see a thing. And not only that, if you're out in a boat and you strike a rock uh, and you get a hole in the front of the boat, when the water comes in the hole in front of the boat, if you don't have the presence of mind to run to the back and bash a hole in the back so the water comes in the front goes out the back, you'd probably sink and get drunk. <laughs> so he thought about all this and he decided he would make a collection of holes. And some of them are over here on the ornamental stand. This is the ornamental stand. <laughs> Comes from an agency. <laughs> this is, you heard about, this is a holy mackerel. Holy mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> this is for golfers. You will love this. This is, would you believe, a hole in one. There's the one. There is the hole. <laughs> this is the professor's pièce de résistance, which is not, as you might think, a French girl who struggles. This is his greatest invention. This is the portable hole. No matter where you go in the world, you can carry your own hole with you like that. And if you want to see a cricket match or a football match or a baseball match, you merely put that up like that and you look through and you don't have to pay any admission, which is a wonderful idea. <laughs> a wonderful idea. Now, the other thing is that this led me to put on the market a wholesale retail. <laughs> and we give you various things in this wholesale. For instance, we give you several pieces of paper. Uh, we give you like one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> we, we give you several pieces of paper. We also give you a small treatise uh, called uh, How to Make Holes or Nothing Spread Thin. Uh, we give you a pair of scissors such as these, which I have embedded in my navel. And we give you several pieces of paper here, which I mentioned. Now, I'm going to show you how you cut a hole. What you do, first of all, is take the scissors like that, and you fold the paper in half, like that. There's the paper. You fold it in half like that. And then, if you cut a semicircle out of that, you will automatically have a hole. So very quickly, I will cut a semicircle out like that. And that point, when we open it out, you will find that we have a hole in the center of the paper, like that. <laughs> 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 
You know what I should have done? I should have folded the other way, and if I'd cut the other way, then we would have had it like that, which is what I meant to do. You could know. Yeah. Somebody said two halves make a hole, and I spend some time in America, and there they have got half dollars, and they call them halves like that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the two halves, and if we cut around the two halves, cut around the two halves, we should have a hole. And if we do that, we will find that we have not, unnaturally, a circle that we have cut out. I want those back. It's not a tip. So we have a little circular hole if we open this out. Ah, yes, there we are. Actually happening. A complete circle like that, which means, of course, naturally we have a circular hole. So when we open this thing out like that, you can see that we have... That's the first time that's happened again. I'm going to show you the invisible hole. Now, I play a lot of golf. This is a golf ball. They don't grow on trees. You have to find them. And this is, for the purposes of this demonstration, the green. There's a draft. Oh, that or you've got wind. Anyhow, keep your mouth shut. We'll do this as best we can. Look. This invisible hole, if you actually hit the ball onto the green, like that, it always goes into the hole, because the invisible hole travels around, and if you observe it from all angles like that, there's the, the front side, and there's the, back, the, the other side. Right, that's a sort of worm's eye view. Now, the joy about the invisible hole is that it slides. For instance, if I want to get the ball from the green, because if you take a ball from the green, you, you get, it loses a stroke. You don't, you probably have one. But what's this? It actually slides like so. And then we have the green and the ball. Right. Playing golf with a golf ball is one thing, but there's one thing that's a total essential on everywhere. And it's not the golf ball, it's the 19th hole, which allows me to say your very good health on behalf of Julie and I. Bless you. Good night. <laughs> says and that's what it means because in this particular part of the show we try to present to you something unusual something you are not likely to see normally and you are not likely to see this normally because let's face it you can actually write the word jump while he's sitting on the floor that's true isn't it madam yes just nod your head if you understand the question and of course you can write the word backwards while you're going forwards with the pen isn't that strange you can write the word forwards and you still keep going forwards it's all odd but the lady we've got on the behind the curtain i mean that lady there is an oddity she's not only writes it backwards forwards but she actually speaks backwards I would like you to welcome Katya Nick. Good evening, Katya. Good evening. Lo ui is ut ne rihib ut i pehirev meya num litnej ne sibel nginavi dog. I couldn't agree more with that. <laughs> and you might think that's a foreign language. Cause Katya is not English, but it is not. Thanks to the wonders of this scientific invention called the tape recorder, we can immediately play it back in the opposite direction. And it really sounded like this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy to be here and to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> you see, isn't that wondrous? We have a gentleman at the end there who does not believe. Well, I can tell you now, sir, that these things are not pre-recorded, like what you are thinking. Oh, no. Uh, madam, where are you from? The United States of America. Right. The United States of America is where this lady is from. There you go. Sounds like Russian. That'll upset you. Right. Let's listen to it backwards. I... I'm from the United States of America. <laughs> wow, isn't that wonderful? 
you, you haven't got a birthday today at all. You? No, 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 no. We, one was supposed to happen. You have. Yes. Happy birthday, sweetheart. What's okay. your first name? Jeanette. Jeanette. Her name is Jeanette, Katya. It is her birthday. Did anybody ever congratulate you backwards? No, no. Ui ud yet serbi pe, tenest read yet serbi pe. Ui ud yet serbi pe, ui ud yet serbi pe. Yes, thank you, you said. Yes, aren't you supposed to say something like, ooh, Uncle, I can't do it. Um, well, listen to what it was backwards. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Janice. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> that is lovely. Wonderful. Super. Katja, you're from Germany originally. Must be difficult in our language. Could you sing me a love song? Yes, I know a love song, but oh. I sing it only for you. Of course. Who else? Som jeg en lot tar jam nicknif mas Når jeg skal os så Jams ru nicknif mas Når jeg ne os så Sia ru nicknif mas Urf så Tjernet råfi Valg ne regidiu Så snæstet reftov Tjernet nicknit no Så snæt ne snæst ske Tjernet ne så snæst I'd hate to hear it if you didn't like me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, I'm sure it was very lovely. Can I hear it the other way around? Strangers in the night, exchanging dances, one drink in the night, what fair the chances, please be sure the love before the night goes through. Something in the I sing it like that. Was so inviting, something can do smile. Was so exciting, something in my heart told me I must have you. Very good, really amazing. It's fantastic, isn't it? Hello, forget. I want you all to be trying this yourselves. You know, tomorrow. In the office and all that. Yeah, name any song. Just, just give me a song. Old MacDonald Farm. Old MacDonald at a farm. Thank you very much. <laughs> What's your name? Dennis. Dennis. Yes, it would be. We've got, we've got a menace in the front row, Katya. Would like you to sing backwards. Old MacDonald had a farm. Oh, yai, yai, ma fedetle not kem glo. Kish kish the rev rev kish the rev kish the re rev kish kish the de re kish kish the de o e a e e a e skish must de e ma se not ne o e a e e a e ma fe de le not kem blo. Well, if that was right, this audience is going to go crackers for you. Right, old MacDonald had a farm. The other way on. Old MacDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O And on his farm He had some chicks E-I-E-I-O With a chick chick He had the chick chick there He had a chick there A chick everywhere A chick chick Old MacDonald had the farm E-I-E-I-O As we discussed at the start of the program, we are now about to reenact the scene of the bullet touch that killed Chung Ling Su. Debbie plays the part of Sui Sin, wife of Chung Ling Su. And the gentleman you can see marking the bullet is from our jury. The bullet is marked so that at the end of the trick we can confirm the same bullet is used throughout. Sue would demonstrate that the powder he was using 
was genuine. musket of the type used by Sue and the powder is placed into the barrel first. of wadding is ramrodded down the barrel compressing the gunpowder ready for ignition thanks to television you are now able to see something that the audience in the days of Sue could not see. You are being taken very close, very close. And the bullet goes in. stage, the gentleman from the audience handles everything so that all is fair and above board. Jack Grossman, the man who faced Chung Ming Su 64 years ago and pulled the trigger, now has that rifle armed by a fully qualified armourer and I show the plate on which I am to attempt to catch the bullet in the trick that killed Chung Ling Su. appearing in his own show at the Opera House Blackpool. Hi, I was, but not a lot. Did you see a whole lot of magic? 